Here we are sitting in the cockpit of uh, the Iroquois 149. Uh, reasonably well equipped for its age, you know, the 1950s technology. Just looking quickly around it, up the top here, on this, we've got main, my, most of the circuit breakers uh, here behind the, the, the top panel. This is mainly lighting uh, and electrics up the top. Uh, with some other bits, a couple of bits and pieces which I won't bother going into. And then moving down onto the instrument panel itself, the co-pilot in a, in a, a helicopter usually, usually sits on the left-hand side and the captain on the, on the right. Uh, I'm not quite sure why that is, but I, it's possibly because uh, the captain or the aircraft commander will operate the collective, which controls the pitch of the rotors, with his left hand and the cyclic, which is the direction, if you like, with his right hand. And I think the, probably because you, t you tend to keep your hands on the cyclic pretty much all the time, it's easier for the captain sitting in the right hand seat to be able to reach the instrument panel uh, and the, uh, the center, con center console uh, with his left hand. Anyway, so on the left hand side, we have the, the co-pilot, Reasonably, reasonable sort of instrumentation, but not as, uh, as as advanced as some of the more more modern aircraft. So flight instruments in the middle in a fairly standard T uh, arrangement, moving across a radar altimeter, and we in the middle here we have the engine instruments, which both the captain and the co-pilot can actually see. Uh, this is torque, which is pretty important in the old Iroquois. It doesn't develop a lot of power. Maximum. Uh, torque was about 50 psi. Uh, below that is the rotor RPM uh, and, and eng engine RPM. Uh, and the idea was to keep it, I don't know whether you can see that, but keep it within the green green arcs here. And that's done with the, um, the, the cyclic and the, um, the collective. Now, <clears throat> um, in the Iroquois, the engine was controlled automatically, uh, as opposed to the old Sioux or Bell 47, where the pilot would have to wind the throttle up and down as he was lowering and, and raising the, the collective. Uh, in the Iroquois, it was, it was done with a, a fuel control unit, which was, uh, which was a big improvement. Uh, Right-hand side, you know, airspeed indicator, uh, attitude indicator, altimeter, basically what is a compass here, but the, uh, as I mentioned before, the Iroquois really only had, when I, in my day anyway, only had one approach aid, which was uh, an NDB, and so that limited its, its ability to fly in instrument conditions. The centre console uh, is mainly radios and intercom down the back end here, um, but we have uh, a f fuel control here and including uh, an emergency uh, governor um, switch here so that if you did have a problem with the fuel control unit, which was the cause of one of the engine failures I had in the Middle East, you could wind the throttle back a bit, engage the, uh, the emergency fuel control and then have manual control over the, the engine <coughs> uh, using the, rot the rolling throttle here on the collective uh, and the position of, of the collective itself. A uh, caution panel here with uh, warning lights in case something did go wrong. Probably in a, in a single engine helicopter, one of the biggest things, apart from having an engine failure or fire, uh, is uh, a, a transmission chip detector. Uh, these are these little magnetic uh, plugs in the, in the transmissions that would pick up uh, metallic particles that might be coming off the, the gears in the transmissions if the, if the transmission was starting to fail. If you had a chip, light, you'd try and get the thing on the ground as quickly as possible before the, the transmission seized. And, uh, and that's about it. Uh, this aircraft is, uh, was, is configured as a, as a gunship, and that's why it's got the, uh, the, the armoured seats, whereas the normal slick aircraft, which is not a gunship, would have similar webbing seats, but without this, this armour uh, around, the, around the pilots. The aircraft uh, were operated in this camouflage uh, configuration or paint scheme here in Australia, uh, and also when we did some operations, say in West Erian or Papua New Guinea, we did a lot of survey ops up there uh, in the in the old days. But the Iroquois were also involved in a couple of uh, peacekeeping operations in the Middle East. The first one was called UNF2, United Nations Emergency Force 2, which was to separate the 
the Israelis from the Egyptians in the Sinai uh, Peninsula, that began, I think, sort of late 1976. I went over in, in November 76, uh, and we'd spend six months over there. Those aircraft were all painted white, uh, so that they were very distinctive and they had big UN markings on the side of them, so they, it was pretty hard to, uh, to, to misidentify them. And we would perform patrols up and down the the uh, buffer zone between the Israelis and the Egyptians on the western side of the Sinai, um, adjacent to the Suez Canal. And look, <coughs> we that was that was interesting, but once again, it wasn't uh, completely uh, boring. Uh, there was one night we were doing a, a practice search and rescue mission in the middle of the Sinai, and it had all been approved by the Egyptians and the Israelis. They knew what we were going to be doing. Uh, we went and did this, this mission for about an hour or so and then landed. It was only a couple of days later that we had a visit from the uh, from a, a, a person who worked in the British Embassy in Cairo and he came and informed us that they had information through SIGINT, which is Signals Intelligence, and monitoring the Egyptian uh, air defence systems up and down the, the Suez Canal and we'd we have been actually engaged by one of the search, uh, the surface to air missile radars and they were about to launch uh, a surface to air missile on us but, uh, but we actually landed just before they did. So, so there were no more night flying SAR missions in the middle of the Sinai after that. Tell us what would, what would have been the outcome? Oh, the outcome would have been no more Pete <laughs> or, or anyone else in the aircraft. I, I don't know what, I can't remember what sort of surface to air missile it was, but it would have completely destroyed the, the aircraft. And we had no missile warning systems in, on fitted to the aircraft in those days. Absolutely no, no countermeasures um, at all. And apart from looking out and saying, oh, what's that bright light coming towards us? <laughs> and, and, but that, oh, look, that leads me into something else that's popped into my head. One of the other things we did uh, in, in Nine Squadron in early in my time there was uh, we started to try and develop some uh, anti-fighter or fighter defence tactics with uh, help from the, the fighter guys at, at Williamtown. And of course they were very, uh, very excited about that because they just like, they like to shoot things down or pretend to shoot things down. So we'd fly down to Williamtown and st start um, doing operations with them to try and work out if there was any anything we could do as a helicopter to defend ourselves from from fighter attack and we started off with uh, one v1 where you'd have one one fighter trying to shoot you down and you're trying to evade and then two v1 where you'd have two fighters uh, and one one helicopter and of course the thing about a helicopter it's particularly a, a, a an iroquois is that it has a, a pendulous suspension system for the rotor so the, actually the weight just hangs underneath and it's uh, it's not fixed to the rotor. So if you if you apply any negative G, what happens is the rotor can just hit the tail boom and come off. So you have to be particularly careful about what what you're doing. But we, you know, we had some um, some pretty good encounters, and the and the fighter guys were actually quite helpful in saying that the best defence is to actually turn into the fighter and try to fly towards it as fast as you can, because that means the fighter has to keep pushing down to, to depress the, uh, the, the, uh, the guns enough to try and shoot you. But we, we used to joke that the best, best defence was to find a, a clearing in the, in the bush, land, engage the force trim, which is like a, a, a holds the control, the control station. So engage the force trim, jump out and run away. That was the best defence against, against a fighter trying to shoot you down. So yeah, it was all uh, there was a lot of stuff going on that were experimental stuff happening. That was uh, some was successful, some was less successful. So look, I had a really great time on Nine Squadron. Great bunch of people. Um, just very brief, briefly after that, uh, I, I had an intelligence job in Canberra for a couple of years, uh, working in what what was a joint intelligence organisation. Then went on to become a flying instructor at Pierce uh, in Western Australia on Mackies. Went back to 12 Squadron uh, after that and had a, had a great time on 12 Squadron and that's been sort of chronicled separately about uh, a week or so ago. Um, after 12 Squadron, the, um, I went down to Central Flying School in Victoria as a flying instructor 
and also as a helicopter examiner. So in one respect, it was like full full circle where I, I used to come back to places like Oakey, Amberley, Fairburn and do the uh, the checks on the helicopter instructors uh, around the place uh, for, for a number of years. While I was at SAIL, I, as well as instructing pilots to become flying instructors, um, I also ended up uh, going into the roulettes uh, as roulette five to start with and then uh, took over as roulette leader for my last year at, at, uh, at CFS. And then after that, I went to air headquarters near Glenbrook in New South Wales in another Intel job, um, then overseas to uh, the UK to do the Advanced Staff College course at Bracknell, um, then back to training command as it was then at Point Cook for a couple of years, and then that's when I left the Air Force as a, as a wing commander after 22 years and then went and joined a civilian organisation working as a, with a as a defence contractor in Saudi Arabia. Um, 